So, uh, D.P. Mukherjee, the most progressive sociologist of that time, and today he is hailed for that. The kind of perception that he has provided about Indian sociology, how it ought to be, was very narrow, confined to the upper caste. Of course, he himself was a Bengali Brahmin, as you know very well. And there were a group of people who have a large number of intellectuals, even today. Uh, I already mentioned, in contrast to that, would be B.R. Ambedkar, who in his uh, address uh, in the 1930s stated, only the Puranas and Shastras and all scriptures that supported caste were removed can he call himself a Hindu. A lot of Indian sociology is very much anchored to the Hindu scriptures. In fact, uh, people like Gure, Kapadia and all others, if you read what they have, marriage and family in India by Kapadia. Hindu social organization by P. N. Prabhu, Pandari Prabhu. This is all I read as an MS student. Uh, I was studying in Pune University. These are all simply extrapolations from these uh, traditional religious texts. And then, as against that came uh, the argument of Srinivas, uh, the field is new, as against the text. And he argued that the field is more authentic, and we should go for that. Yeah, pictures here of the Hindu. But I have already contested that. When you take the field view, are you doing it from the perspective of the the Mohalla of the untouchable? Or you are living with the untouchable? Our, our uh, uh, famous uh, sociologist, social anthropologist, uh, uh, Andre Bethe, his book, Cast Class Bar, they all read that. And he says there, he lived with Agrihara, lived in Agrihara, where diamonds were. But suppose he lived in Cheri, where the so called untouchable. <laughs> Mute everybody, sir. Sorry for the interruption. Please mute everyone. Yeah, sure. Is it okay? Can I continue? Yes, sir. Sorry oh. for the interruption. No, 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 that's okay. That's okay. Uh, we must get used to these kind of aberrations, technological aberrations. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we have to control over that. So, uh, the Indian society has the experience and the kind of knowledge that is produced by the upper class men is a very partial kind of knowledge. Uh, exclusion is embedded in that. What we need to do is to think in terms of producing knowledge from the perspective of those who are from the perspective of below and that i'm not saying that the knowledge produced from above or from the perspective of the privileged is necessarily uh, wrong unacceptable but that is one view but there is a counter view how about looking at uh, the adivasi perspective of Indian society. You know the uh, number of Adivasis in India? There are 100 million people. And the united Germany, that means East and West, 
after the fall of the Berlin Wall was only 18 years, the most powerful country in the world, even today, after the United States. That's only 18 million people. But our Adivasis made a hundred million people. It is a sea of humanity. How can we ignore their perspective and think in terms of serving Indian? No. So our knowledge is very partial, uh, very biased. We have to think in terms of a more totalistic uh, uh, position. And of course, the uh, running uh, tension between uh, knowledge produced in India, between, uh, between uh, the uh, North and the South, is so well known. Uh, the so-called Aryan uh, versus the Dravidian perspective. Uh, I have no time to uh, go into it. Uh, uh, it. It's almost one hour. So what do we do? Should we... Uh, so how many, uh, yeah, I think uh, you may like to take some questions. Yes. If there are. Sorry for the interruption. No, no, no. Yes, if there is a. Sir, thank you so much. Should, should I ask the audience to pose some questions? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 I will not. Because I was saying, you know, yes. can I give you the time after questions and uh, questions if, if you permit? So let, just two minutes. Two minutes. Yeah. yeah. I, okay. Yeah. All right. I just would like to thank, uh, you know, Professor Tiki Uman, sir, for uh, the thought provocative lecture. And now, um, you know, I would uh, conclude as such, but I will open the house for discussion. I also acknowledge the presence of our senior Professor Satya Naranya Garu from mm. Osmanu University. Yes. Uh, I didn't see you in the beginning, so sorry. Yes. <laughs> and uh, Sir Professor Guru Swami, um, please take your time. Thank you, Professor Rajailu, for giving me the opportunity to make an intervention. At the outset, I appreciate and congratulate an wonderful talk delivered by our uh, Professor Emeritus, Professor T.K. Woman. Um, and his uh, lecture is uh, very much conditioned on social formation and the change, respective from below. When we look at uh, the perspective from below in the Indian context, Obviously, inequality persists. This inequality is arise out of caste-based, gender-based, religion-based, region-based, and conditioned in our Indian social structure and the system of stratification. Therefore, as you have rightly pointed out, both the exclusion and the inclusion do persist simultaneously in a plural society of our kind. Therefore, conformities will be there and the disconformities may also be there. At the same time, continuity will be there and the deviance or change will also be there in a plural society of our kind, which is marked by a lot of differences, disparities and exclusions. Now, when we, when we look at from the point of view of change, with reference to the constitution since independence, preamble says, we the people of India solemnly resolve to constitute a liberty, equality, fraternity, social justice by promoting democratic, secular, social welfare state. Now, when we look at the the constitutional declaration on the one hand and what is in reality with reference to social structure and the stratification from the point of view of social formation and change, we see a huge number of problems, which may be social, cultural, economic, and relational. 
Therefore, when we look at the perspective from the below, what would be the role for the social institutions from below, like family, marriage, Panchayat Raj institutions, particularly Gram Sabha? And we have started using these phrases inclusive growth since our 10th Bible plan onwards. Have we succeeded in our attempts in planned and directed social change in order to ensure the constitutional declarations? Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, Professor Benson, you have a question? And then Professor Tapan Mohanty. Oh. Oh, yeah. uh, thank you. Uh, morning again. Uh, thank you for the good. Oh, I'm probably, it's, uh, up, I hope it's not afternoon yet in your place. <laughs> uh, could be, it is. Uh, it's morning this way. Sorry, I, I, I thank you, my teacher, <laughs> uh, for the, uh, the wonderful and powerful uh, exposition on this uh, very critical topic. Uh, I have a, a, a quick comment and probably place with a, a bit of a question. Uh, I do notice uh, that your uh, your framework or, uh, of anal uh, analytical framework uh, that is the the contradistinction between the subaltern view and the nationalist geography uh, strongly applies to the caste reality, particularly in India. Uh, but then uh, the access of exclusion extend beyond the caste. Uh, for example, uh, in my own country. We call it ethnicization of politics, of uh, economy, and public life in general. Uh, how would these, how would these two perspectives apply uh, to, uh, especially the analysis of interreligious relations or class phenomena? Uh, the last one is uh, the issue of uh, social accretion uh, when uh, the uh, the dominant groups. Uh, impose and gradually uh, make the, uh, the society uh, uh, see the society from their own perspectives uh, probably the language uh, the uh, issues like uh, merit for example uh, is very common especially among the dominant groups uh, when they, they introduce this somehow it becomes part and parcel of the language of the dominated groups and this tends to perpetuate what we may call uh, uh, exclude the reality of the uh, dominated class. What would be your uh, comment on this? Because uh, then, uh, the subaltern groups, for example, appropriate this, appropriate the language and the culture of the dominant groups. How do we deal with this? Yeah. Okay. Uh, we will take two more questions, sir. Tapan Mohanty, and uh, after that, Subrata Sinai, Dr. Subrata. Now, Professor Tapan Mohanty, can you... Thank you, Ajay. Uh, sir, it's a pleasure. Uh, good afternoon, sir. It's a pleasure to see you after a long, long time. Uh, sir, uh, as you have rightly quoted, uh, Professor uh, uh, D.P. Mukherjee and our late Professor uh, Jogendra Singh also used to talk very highly about Professor D.P. Mukherjee's uh, uh, concept that what you, think you call as Marxologist. But, sir, you also told also in the class that uh, he said uh, all our uh, Sastras are sociological. So, sir, do you find a contradiction in his being a concept of being a maxiologist and also finding the Sanskrit texts are sociological? And uh, it is also the same concerns that we are being, you know, uh, discussing from our master's days. So, I will be happy, sir, we could uh, highlight this aspect. Thank you very much, sir. Okay, the last question from uh, Dr. Naik. Dr. Naik. Uh, uh, hi, I'm Subhadar Shinaik. Uh, I must thank you, Professor, for this uh, very enlightening talk. Uh, uh, when you, uh, I have very particular questions to what you claim is where are the subaltern perspectives? My question to your submission is that where was the opportunity? So, and 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 uh, to add to it, where do you see? the scope of pursuing such research agenda in the contemporary political discourse. Thank you, sir. Okay. There's two more questions, sir. Talk about inclusion of women. So my colleagues, Dr. Binita Behra and Dr. Abba Chauhan also raised questions. I'll give 
Vinita now and then Abba. Yes, sir. Uh, so I, I was just thinking uh, about the fact that since uh, at a certain period of history, which eventually, uh, uh, like uh, it, uh, like it helped us to grow the spirit of nationalism, which eventually resulted in our independence. So uh, we, as Indians, as a country, we also needed not muscle flexing, but to show that we are in the contest with the Westerners because they had a civilizational identity and we were competing against that. And I uh, so can we yeah, say that in the was contest, that, it was the Westerners from the above because they had a civilizational identity to show to the we were in the against that. that. And that I uh, also so can be yeah, this is a common yeah. kind of a thing. Yeah. And which yeah. kind of yeah. has yeah. stayed on with us, you know, the inertia of it. And we keep feeding on it. And as uh, my, uh, the, uh, I think Professor Knight, as he rightly said, that even the academics itself, the politics of it and the market that feeds mm -hmm. on it, uh, how much of it in India? Looking at the Indian perspective, how much of it is that that uh, you know uh, this is something that we will be uh, given an opportunity if somebody wants to publish or do a study like this, will we ever get a funding for such kind of studies? Yeah. Abba, Professor Abba Chauhan. Yeah. Uh, good afternoon, sir. Thank you so much for this uh, very interesting and enriching lecture. Uh, I have a very specific question related to the insiders and outsiders view that you talked about or ethic and ethic and emic uh, perspectives. Uh, in this, I would just like to say that uh, you were mentioning about Srinivas and others uh, who were, uh, you belong to a particular caste, the higher caste and lived in the uh, you know, those kind of localities. But uh, I just feel that there are difficulties uh, of field work and field work situations. Uh, the field, as Bordu would say. So uh, he did try to be.
Inspirer since very long time, and we have met and we have very great uh, heights of our knowledge generation in Indian society. And he has rightly touched about the DP Mutarji view of knowledge generation and the uh, MS Invas and Grace Knowledge Generation limitations in Indian society. And he has rightly brought out to uh, mentioning about the Ambedkar perspective of uh, uh, knowledge, how he has actually. Uh, directed us to uh, look at Indian society and its nature and the constitutional contribution for the inclusive kind of thing. And it, even today, it is limitation, it's a very big challenge. And for the Indian sociologist, he has given a direction for us that what is the problem in Indian uh, society and the sociologist and the, the generation of knowledge. It is a challenging task for all of us. He has given the direction. I am very much thankful to him and particularly Ajayilu to uh, both of you and after a long time i could hear this kind of uh, this is the problem i have been always facing and i am thankful to you sir and uh, i will be me uh try to meet you very soon thank you very kind of you for giving me this opportunity yeah thank you uh munna you have a question munna is our student leader and a senior student of our center so last question very quick straightforward question munna are you there? Okay, so we can't hear him. Over to you, sir. Yeah, now the difficulty is it is already 12.25. Yes. <laughs> we are so, supposed to wind up by 12 o'clock. By 12 o'clock. This, this is the thing, sir. You have so many uh, followers. <laughs> and uh, also people <laughs> want to hear your viewpoint. Sir, it's not always that we have you. <laughs> I know. So I don't think I can um, really answer all of all questions, but I'll just uh, look at a few of them, uh, and I may not uh, address each each of those uh, person who asked question uh, one by one, but some I will. Uh, the first point I want to make is that we must make a distinction, I don't know who asked this, uh, between stratification and hierarchy. See, stratification is a universal phenomenon. There is no society, even the so-called uh, simple Ad Adivasi society also has stratification between men and women, the mukhya and the rest. So, there's no society without stratification. But hierarchy is a different thing as an Indian caste system. You cannot even challenge hierarchy. Of course, now it's being challenged. So the uh, impossibility of changing hierarchy because it is embedded in the religious doctrines. What is karma? From where we get the idea of karma and rebirth? I narrate a personal experience. When I was doing field work in Rajasthan villages, I was living in a school and I never lived with anybody. I lived in the institution, it's like school or some such. And I used to have a set of visitors. I've written about it. Uh, a set of visitors, young people. And uh, Nescafe had come into the market recently. I used to carry a big deba, deba of Nescafe with me. I'll make some coffee and share it with them. So one day in uh, sometime, summer, I I used to carry my water with me. I was in the and summer. And later became the first in 1976. Water is exhausted. I asked for some water. They said, sir, we cannot give you water. You are a Brahmin, which is wrong. But that's their perception of me. And uh, giving water to you, a Brahmin, is against our karma. That means the <laughs> Ms. can you please mute everyone? 
sorry for the interruption, sir. <laughs> Anyway, I took with them and finally took the water. And the summer of the new village, you know, things spread very quickly. In the evening, uh, my visitors were there, young people. Then I was about to prepare coffee. I'm told, no, we will not take coffee from your hands. I asked why? Because you took water from the Chamar Marga. See, whether I am a believer or not, and that's the point uh, Abha has made very correctly, it's not the point. Whether I am acceptable as a field worker to the people, and therefore I must respect the norms of the village. And therefore, uh, you cannot hold on to your idealism. You have to understand the people's position and adjust with them. And that is one of the big challenges of doing field work in Indian village. I was uh, making it in a slightly different context because there was so much of emphasis given, at least the time when I was doing that field work, on participant observation. My point was participant observation is an impossibility in Indian multi caste village with everybody. You can participate with some groups. And then I was making the argument. But did anybody live in the Chamar Mahalla or the untouchable residential area? And that is very clear in Indian villages, particularly in the nucleated villages of North India. And that was the point I was trying to make. So I, I recognize the difficulty of doing field work. But my point was that you must not mix up the two. So stratification and hierarchy are different. Hierarchy is something very peculiar to the Indian situation because of the caste system. There the issue is legitimacy. And uh, this is the specificity of the situation of the field also affects the field work. As field workers, we should be aware of that. Now, inclusive growth. Satnarana uh, raised this. See, inclusive growth for the first time as a concept was used in 11 to 5 year plan. You can go back and read the document. And that was when uh, Manmohan Singh was the prime minister. But when the economists think of, or even sociologists, think of inclusive growth, all that they have in mind is a little more income to these people. But I am not talking about income. I am talking about the, the perspective from which you look at society and how that determines the possibility of producing knowledge which is more authentic. That was the point I was trying to. I mean, I know that uh, many of our people will not uh, will not uh, accept my perspective. They have not accepted it, and that's why I rarely do uh, any of my books. Uh, and I have quite a few are uh, prescribed in Indian universities. I know you told me uh, that you ask your students to read my book on. Uh, Inclusive. So this is my one of my, uh, oh, I mean, latest book. This is the book, and this was uh, uh, written when I was. Uh, so can you can you put it closer to the camera? Can camera you? is up. Oh, okay. <laughs> and this this was up. this was written. Right? Yes. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Where it is? Yes. When you I now see. It. Yeah. When I was a national fellow of ICSSR. Anyway, so uh, inclusive growth is used in a very narrow sense by uh, economists. It's good enough as a beginning, but we have to expand the idea of inclusive growth. Uh, some people use the term participate growth. Now, um, uh, 
Benson's uh, observations, you know, uh, you, you're from uh, Kenya, no? Yes, Kenya, University of Nairobi. Uh, you know, the, the question that you have raised is very important and interesting, but the essence of that is identity. Now, we all recognize that hmm, the per capita income should go up, this, that, and the other. But nobody wants to talk about identity because it is a conservative notion. I don't believe so. Identity is very important. And each group has its identity. And identity is a double-edged weapon. On the one hand, identity gives a kind of uh, selfhood to people. On the other, identity can also be very negative. It can go against uh, some of the progressive ideas. But I <laughs> Reserving time, mute everyone. Uh, identity, which is culture, need not necessarily be antithetical to somebody else's position or identity. So I think it is time. Uh, I, again, I have in my book, which is published from uh, OUP, it's a collection of essays. I dealt with identity at length. Uh, the importance of identity as a notion. But identity is now taken to be conservative and anti-progressive. Uh, I don't believe so. Uh, that is necessary. But as, as they say, human beings can't live by bread alone. Bread is necessary, but not sufficient. So okay. you should be proud. Uh, as Vinita said, Amkis is a company. That feeling is very important in in the contemporary world. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, Tapan uh, raised this uh, point about uh, shastras, isn't it? Shastras. You see, we must uh, uh, differentiate between the epistemological foundations of knowledge. The positivist kind of knowledge that is produced and most of uh, knowledge production in the world of uh, science, you know, particularly when we say science, what we mean is, uh, I have again distinguished uh, I have a book on knowledge and society. I don't know if you've seen it. It's a collection of essays by OUP. Uh, I have said that sciences are of three kinds. And unless we understand the nature of the phenomenon that we are dealing with, subject matter, which determines the methodology. For example, there are one dimensional uh, I mean, sciences, physics. Geology, they only deal with one dimension, material things, materiality. Then there are two dimensions. There are matter plus life, life sciences. You think of uh, animal or you think of plant. They have both uh, matter and life. You know, we have been told that uh, if you play music, the animal will respond to that. The milk will be more in terms of yielding, or the plant will come in that direction. These are all established. Then there is three-dimensional food. That is matter, life, and culture. Culture is symbolism. <coughs> Human beings. The study of human beings is a three-dimensional. We have matter, we have body, we have life, and the thing which distinguishes human beings from the rest of the world, material world, and the life world is culture. 
culture is involved. So unless we have a methodology to understand this uh, tri-dimensional phenomenon, <coughs> sorry, speaking of real appreciation. Although there has been a lot of discussion on the methodology, nobody has really talked in terms of the nature of the phenomenon study and how it affects the methodology. And in this book, the introduction, I have tried to talk about the Knowledge and Society book, talked about methodology. Then, um, Vinita, <coughs> again, well, Nike has talked about Sanskritization, then this. You talked about Sanskritization. But I think I have to tell you that. Did identity, Indian identity. Yes. yes. Now, uh, you referred to civilization. See, there was, yeah, there was a time when the, the Western people. See, everybody here. Who is going to talk about this? Mezabin, can you mute everyone, please? You are to Except to me. I put Mezabin, are you there? Put everybody on mute themselves. We listen to sir. Please, please mute yourself. From Viva, ma'am, it, it was coming. You see, civilization is a very recent phenomenon which is recognized. There was a time when the Westerners believed that everybody has culture, not only few have civilization. But this idea was uh, proved to be wrong when archaeology started. Archaeology means the beginning. All these uh, Mexican civilization, for example, or even Indian civilization, Indus Valley civilization, all came to recognition. The idea was the West had both civilization and culture, but others are only culture. Because even the peasant, Adivasis, everybody has culture, their way of life, but civilization only they had. But that idea has been. I remember when I was an MS student, there was a long correspondence between a man called S.D. Sangalia, one of the top archaeologists of India, and Martin oh, yeah. Miller, the uh, man who studied the uh, Indus Valley. Oh, no, After six months of correspondence, Miller wrote to Sangalia that he conceived that Indus Valley was a semi barbarian civilization. So that was the attitude. If you had a civilization, which was a barbarian civilization, not a real civilization. So that is again a, a, an attitude that the world over uh, prevailed for quite some time. Civilization is a monopoly of the West, and uh, the rest did not have civilization. Abbas point I have already covered when I referred to the uh, so the insider eyes outside of dichotomy or dilemma is a very real one. Mm. And as I told you, uh, this is a insider outsider paper of mine was published in 1986, but it was only after sociological bulletin refused to publish it. And finally, they wrote to me by the time the International Sociology in his volume one, number one, have published it. Professor Kevin Kapadi wrote to me. But for one year, he did not respond because it was anti establishment. I don't know whether all of you have read this paper, Insider or Outsider Dichotomy in India, Primordial Collectives of Nation Building. That's the subtitle. 
It is reprinted. Uh, in fact, it is translated to 14 languages. Yeah, Satnarayana, you, your point is well taken about uh, knowledge generation. <coughs> I was trying to suggest that the present uh, trend which I am uh, seeing in India is that <coughs> we are <coughs> going away from the real matters. Today everybody is emphasizing the importance of uh, technology. Technology is very, very important. It is necessary, but not sufficient. Because of technology, we can sit here and talk. If technology was not there, <coughs> we could not have done it. So it is necessary, but not sufficient. And that we must keep in mind. Uh, I am a person who argues for technological pluralism. You see, <coughs> not that uh, you know, the entirety of technology should be behind technology. You need uh, intermediate technology. As a person like uh, Schumacher argued, small is beautiful, but not everything small is beautiful. Again, I have argued with him, I knew him personally. Uh, there is a Schumacher Center in Delhi, of which I am the chair. <coughs> so I'm a great admirer of him. But I also differ with some of the ideas. So you have to you have to uh, think in terms of uh, generating knowledge uh, according to the needs and challenges of uh, the changing world. We need, uh, as I said, uh, technology. But technology is not a substitute for everything. And that will be my position that. Okay, I mean, these kind of things can go on, but uh, I don't know the colleague, we have uh, exceeded our time by 45 <laughs> minutes. Uh, so, yeah, we can't, you are not audible. Ma'am, you are not audible, ma'am. Yeah. Oh, thank you so much, sir. Uh, you mentioned uh, we are beyond time. Yeah. So uh, thank you uh, for the, uh, you know all the attend, uh, uh, participants and uh, the questions from Dr. Zia and Kurmi and also from Dr. Datta and Biswas and others. I think we can't take it up anymore since uh, time is up. I now request my colleague, Dr. Ramanus uh, to deliver the board of thanks. Is it necessary? Uh, <laughs> 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 yeah. So, Chairperson uh, uh, Professor Ajay Lulumai, HOD of the Center for the Study of Social Exclusion and Inclusion Policy, and uh, all the participants. Let me uh, take this opportunity to thank Professor uh, TK Woman for a wonderful, insightful analysis where he has drawn our attention to a very, very important aspect, which is the perspective missing from the people. And uh, actually, majority of the academics, even if they know that this perspective is missing, they don't spell it out. Maybe there is a bias again here also. Uh, that is one aspect, sir. Second yeah. aspect is, even if there is a contribution from the below, it's not been made into a part of the dominant discourse. That's also, uh, 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 as you have rightly said, attitude or uh, discrimination, something we need to fix it there. But uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very, very wonderful kind of a present, uh, thing, sir. Uh, we, we all have learned from your uh, presentation. Of, uh, after a long time, it is really very happy to listen to you, sir. Thank you so much for uh, such a very insightful kind of a uh, a uh, 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 discussion today, sir. Thank you so much. I also thank all other professors from different uh, uh, corners, particularly from Kenya. Other countries have also participated, and not less than 100 members online webinar have participated. This is a good number, actually. Uh, we haven't seen in the recent past. That that is a, a very very happy thing today. Uh, 
and thank you so much sir and i also would like to thank all our office uh, staff for taking i mean uh, making this a grand success with their efforts thank you so much and uh, I, I i wish everyone good afternoon once again thank you so much thank you thank you thank you madam i would like to thank you